Before we come to the reading of the word for today, I'm just going to pray over it, so let's pray together. Oh Lord, thank you for your word. Feed us by your word. Nourish our souls with this provision. Let it take up residence in us and permeate us fully, body, spirit, heart, and mind, so that we gladly make much of you as we all collaborate together for the sake of the kingdom. Amen. The passage of scripture today is um, in the beginning. It's in Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. <clears throat> then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him, took him to the holy city and set him hot on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, You are the Son of God. Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to Christ. Every religion and philosophy in the world attempts to explain evil, some by explaining that it doesn't actually exist, or that humans have a certain amount of power. One of the challenges for understanding the scripture's explanation of evil is to understand that it does not begin at the beginning, it begins at the beginning of God's story of creation and pursuit of his people. But if you read Genesis 1, 2, and 3, when the serpent shows up, it's like, who's the serpent? How come we don't have a description of him? How come we don't have, you know, a scouting report on this before we get into it? And you study the rest of Scripture and you find out that um, angels are created before God creates the world. The devil, the tempter, Satan, all important words and all either a descriptor or a title, rebelled against God. It's described by Jesus and in Isaiah and certainly uh, explained in great deal in Revelation. And what we're focusing on today is using the story of Matthew 4, which is a true story, as both the true story that it is that empowers us and our ability to resist both temptation and evil. So when we pray, as many of you probably already prayed this morning, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil... It's because Jesus endured Satan and didn't sin to save us and to protect us. And we continue to ask him for ongoing protection until he returns, and we no longer have to do that because he will have banished sin and pollution and death and the evil one. I was talking with a psychologist friend a few years ago Hmm. We'll just leave that. <laughs> I was talking with a psychologist friend a few years ago, and he said it takes on average eight solid compliments to match one negative thing that someone tells you. Why? Because of the curse because of the ever-presence of evil in the world. And that's such an anemic example, but it's something that affects us on a daily basis, right? I used to think of temptation and evil as like two sides of, the, of a coin. One is the evil that we cannot see, 
and one is evil that we can see. I now think of them as more of overlapping categories. When we are tempted and we do not resist it, we often are participating in the evil that is infecting so much of the world. We sing about it more at Christmas than at other times, far as the curse is found. Because it is found in most nooks and crannies of the world. Anywhere that God's shalom has been removed or violated or polluted, that's evil that we're asking God to protect us from. Temptation can be spotted, named, and avoided. Evil oftentimes cannot. And it reminds us of the truth, even though I think of them as overlapping more than I used to, the truth, is, which is that we cannot see much of the evil in the world. We cannot see angels or demons, except occasionally through miraculous means I will not attempt to explain in this moment. We cannot see the world that has been corrupted. We can see a lot of the nobility of the world. I was sitting with a friend and some crows were attacking some hawks. I think they were crows. There were multiple crows, not ravens, right? Yeah. Crows were attacking hawks. And first I was like, that's beautiful, that hawk. Wait a minute. It's actually scary. Those are all large birds and they're attacking one another. We don't know how much of that is nature and beautiful and good and how much of that is pollution that entered the world through sin described in Genesis. The story the Bible tells us is that God created the world and called it good, and before he did that, an adversary arose. Not an opponent, not a god, but an adversary, and that adversary's name is Satan. Satan is a Hebrew word for adversaries, also called the devil, diabolos, the tempter, the one who leads us away from good, righteousness, peace, joy, into death, sin, harming one another, violating God's holiness with our actions and thoughts. And we are the defiant resistors of that darkness. If you are a follower of Jesus, when you follow him, with your words and actions internally and externally, you bring the kingdom of heaven to bear in a world infected and polluted by the curse. Peter says it this way, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at a proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on you because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary... The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory and cli- who, <laughs> who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. There's the first point of my outline. And I'm sorry, Simon, but it's ringing just a little bit up here. If you could unring it, the rest of the sermon will be better. (laughs) For me, like I'll deliver it better. Thank you. Jesus endured Satan in Matthew chapter 4, and he did not sin. And it's worth looking at the kinds of temptations the devil brings to Jesus, not because they're metaphors, they're actual temptations that Satan tempted Jesus with. But it's worth looking at the kind because the devil's style, and therefore his minion style, and therefore the unsanctified parts of you, the parts of you that are not grown up into maturity and faith yet, that's called your flesh, Romans 7, and the parts of the world that are polluted are going to use the same style to tempt us to sin and thereby participate in the evil of the world. He first says, why don't you use your power for self-interest? And that is how temptation sneaks in, right? 
Use your relative power. We talk about this all the time. You have relative power. It's money, time, hands, words. Now you should just use it so you feel better. Nope, that's not what it's for. Your good is included in the gospel call on your life, but it is not the primary reason you are given power. You are given power through all those means I just talked about to glorify God, enjoy him, to serve your neighbor, and for you. But it's in that order. That's why we go over it all the time. And there's a sweetness to that. It could sound selfish. It could sound like you're not important, but it's actually very sweet. It reminds us that we're called into purpose. When we resist temptation, we're participating in the good purposes of God and where heaven inbreaks the world in small ways that do not seem profound to us, but in his hands are profoundly healing and repairing the world even now. Satan tempted Jesus to essentially use his power in a gimmicky way to build a following more quickly than he, than he should have by falling off of about a 90-foot tower and then just jumping up. He could have built a following very quickly that way, gained some attention in a not great way, potentially shortcut your purposes in the world. And then the third temptation is interesting because the Bible is not clear here whether Satan had the power to give Jesus all that authority because he might have been deceiving him. I'd actually never thought of that before. But listen, this is very important because some of you fear the evil that you cannot see. This is very, very, very important. Satan doesn't have an iota more influence, power, authority to change anything than what God has given him. If you read the book of Job, there's a protracted discussion between, in that case, the Satan um, and God. And any, uh, Satan only has the authority to touch what God tells him he can touch and to affect what God tells him he can affect. And I say that because in Matthew chapter 4, it is not clear that Satan actually even has the authority. So he might have been lying. But the temptation is to give the world peace in the short term and thereby ruin the mission of God in the long term, which is to remove a worse slavery even than worldwide war, because that's what Jesus would do if given the reins of the governments of the world. He will eventually have those. He has not taken up that, though they are his. And if he had done that, he would not then have been able to lead us away from the greater ill than even all of the wars and terrors and violence of the world, which is the eternal slavery of death and sin. Every answer Jesus gives is either from, De two of them are from Deuteronomy 6 and one of them is from Deuteronomy 8. And the reason is he's deliberately likening himself to Moses, the man called by God to lead the nation of Israel after 400 plus years of captivity, out of actual slavery into freedom and life. The first clue we have is that Jesus fasted for 40 days. Moses also fasted for 40 days. But then these quotations are from God correcting the nation of Israel when they did not resist temptations to idolatry and despair. This is Matthew's version of John chapter 15, leading us who are not trained in Jewish school a little bit more indirectly than we might like to understand that now a restoration of our relationship with God is through faith in Jesus, who is a new and a better Moses. Jesus is being very deliberate in his quotation. He could have quoted lots of different scriptures to make his point to Satan. He didn't even have to quote scripture to make his point to Satan, but he did to help us understand that now faith in him is how we are freed from the slavery of sin and death into life with God. Moses not only rescued his people out of slavery, he also gave them God's good guidance in the world through the Ten Commandments and the rest of the Torah. Jesus does that right after this in Matthew chapters 5 and 6 and 7. He is an even better 
and more profound rescuer. He is an eternal rescuer. He gives good and perfect guidance about death choices to avoid and life choices to embrace and choose. Jesus is beginning to fulfill in this moment his calling to reconcile people to God and guide them in this life away from death. And he did so for our salvation. Because there is a lack of salvation. He guided us into heavenward lives because there's an alternative, a hellish life of selfishness and dishonoring God and harming neighbor instead of caring for them. There is actual joy in this world and there's a lack of joy. The gospel calls us into purpose, which means we are tempted and there is a life without purpose, which I think is one of despair. The people of Israel were enslaved and God knew that was not good. They groaned and God heard them. He sent Moses to rescue them and in the process, justice is done to a very violent and idolatrous nation and many from that nation became followers of God. It's kind of just snuck into the story of the Exodus, but many Egyptians became people of God through that story because they realized the gods they were serving were violent and terrible and the God of Israel was one of care. Care is not the right word. Justice, truth, actual power, not a dead God, but a living God. And I say that because Jesus, through the pen of Matthew in chapter 4, and then the rest of his book, is saying he is the new and better version of this. There is a slavery in this world, and we can be free of it through trusting him. There are decisions of death that we can avoid and thereby honor him and serve our neighbor. When we pray, lead us not into temptation. We're asking to avoid evil we can understand. And when we pray, uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, we're saying help us to avoid the evil that we cannot see. And these are the ways that we are people of resistance. What is the last thing that Satan wants for you to do, other than to be alive, is to worship. That's why this is so profound. If all the things Jesus says about the two kingdoms are true, you're doing right now the very last thing that Satan wants you to do. And the reason I say that is to encourage you the very, very last thing the adversary of God wants is people worshiping the living and true God. The last hour, last 49 minutes, has been an act of defiance on your part against the darkness of the world. Your prayers, your befriending of one another, your song, is a move of heavenly light amidst the pollution of the curse. And if the devil can't tempt you to believe that worship doesn't matter, he will attempt to get you to worship something that is not a god, like your securities, your 403B or your 401K, your 529 if your kids are teenagers. And those things are important but if they cause us to lose sleep, if we give to them effortlessly and not to other things, they start to become idols. And if the devil can't tempt us to worship those things, perhaps our children's happiness, which is important. Your goal is not to make your child miserable. Your goal is also not to rely upon your children's happiness for your happiness. If the devil cannot successfully tempt us into that kind of temptation which then leads to evil, he'll tempt us towards hypocrisy. To different lives that are different what we say and what we do. And if the devil can't tempt us that, he's going to tempt us to overwork, especially those of us who will make more money if we work seven days out of seven. 
It'll lead us away from thinking that one day in seven is given for our rest and prayer and celebration and feasting. Make no mistake, learning to live as though you get to play and pray and rest is an act of resistance. Even in a world that loves diversion as much as ours, it doesn't understand or appreciate rest. When you choose to honor your parents, even your parents, that is an act of resistance and light in this world. The nation of Israel didn't want to honor their parents because no culture cared for its old people 3,000 years ago. They just didn't, they didn't care. That's why the fifth commandment is so important. And then in Jesus' time, people were giving extra money to the church so that they didn't have to care for their parents. They found this like legalistic loophole so they didn't have to care for their parents. And Jesus just blasts them for it. Multiple times in Matthew. For us, we just put them out of our mind in the 21st century. But the command of God, that is a temptation, to the command of God is to honor our parents, which is tempting for us to not want to do and is very challenging to do and requires wisdom, and it's a command of God. To learn to avoid murder. Pretty easy, unless we read Matthew 5. Oh, geez. Murder in our heart is bad, too. To resist that temptation is a challenge for us to not judge one another. But when we do, that is resisting the darkness and embracing heavenly light in our world. To resist lust. The world just doesn't even care. The world, I think, as far as I can tell, thinks lust is actually an important part of how relationships are made and done. And God says, avoid it. It's harmful. It dishonors me and one another and harms yourself. Our worship and our prayer and our actions are all reflective of our allegiance to God and they are all moves of resistance in this world. They're all places where the kingdom of heaven inbreaks. Jesus endured Satan and did not sin for our salvation and for our protection. Jesus' half-brother James, who thought he was crazy at least twice during Jesus' ministry, then met Jesus after he rose from the dead and penned these words, among others, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James went from thinking that Jesus was crazy to then hearing this story later about the devil tempting Jesus, then understanding that James himself could resist temptation because of the work Jesus did on behalf of him. And he was willing to die for it. He was actually pushed off of not the tall temple, but another temple. He didn't die. He got down on his knees and began praying for the people who pushed him off the temple. And then they murdered him. He was willing to die because he believed his half-brother, who he used to think was crazy, was actually Lord. And through that power, he was able to resist the power of the devil because Jesus did and did not sin for us. My hope in preaching this sermon this way is to encourage and comfort and convict you to pray daily. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For your glory, the good of neighbor, and even our own good. Would you pray with me? Father, we praise you for your kindness and we thank you for it. We ask that it would be ever increasingly clear to us how and when and where temptation arises that we might avoid it. And we ask even as we struggle to fully understand the two kingdoms, we ask for your protection from the evil one and from evil. Jesus, we are so thankful that you resisted and endured temptation 
for us. Holy Spirit, help us to be your joyful, obedient followers because of our great love and trust for you and in you. Amen.